We have a, a very crowded show tonight, so I'm going to try to just talk very quickly. We have 11 speakers. Um, I'm going to start out with a little introduction, and then we're going to have our speakers speak. We're, there also will be a little intermission, so you can, you can catch your breath. During that intermission, we're going to be showing little three-minute videos, so if you do want to stay in, we've started this odd little uh, video series on the web. And if you feel the need to ask questions, you'll be able to ask a maximum of two questions for each speaker. Um, I don't mean you personally, I mean you collectively on that. <laughs> and if you want to heckle, on the other hand, feel free at any point. So this is all about improbable research and the Ig Nobel Prizes. And it's all about things that have this quality, things that first make people laugh and then make them think. What people think, that's up to them. <laughs> this is a photograph of an Ig Nobel Prize winner holding an Ig Nobel Prize. The Ig Nobel Prizes we have been giving out since 1991. We give 10 of these every year. They are for achievements that first make people laugh, then make them think. Most of these are in science or medicine or technology but not all of them. They could be in absolutely anything. But the achievement has to be real, and the person has to be real. You'll meet um, this person in a bit. Uh, I will just, for the moment, ask him to stand and take a bow. His name is David Sims. <laughs> and this also, that photo and this photo were taken just a couple of months ago, about four months ago, at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony which is held at Harvard University. Um, these were taken moments after the ceremony. This is a team that won another of the prizes. And they, too, are holding their Ig Nobel Prize. The prize is made of very cheap materials every year. <laughs> and here's a closer look at this year's. The design is different. We have a theme that we choose, a different theme we choose each year for the ceremony. This year's theme was redundancy. And that's reflected <laughs> in this. As you can see, it's a hunk of wood with a little sign on it saying that this is an Ig Nobel Prize. Behind that, there's another sign mounted on it. says, this plaque certifies the existence of the Ig Nobel Prize. And behind that, another plaque saying, this plaque uh, verifies the certification of the existence. <laughs> if you're chosen to win a prize, first of all, that's not easy. We, we have more than 7,000 new nominations every year for the Ig Nobel Prizes. And that's in addition to the nominees from previous years who remain under consideration. And if you're chosen to win, we quietly, in most cases anyway, we quietly get in touch with you and we give you the opportunity to decline this honor. <laughs> Few people turn it down. If you are offered and accept, you get three things. You get an Ig Nobel Prize, although you have to turn up at the ceremony to collect the prize. You get a piece of paper saying that you are an Ig Nobel Prize winner, and that paper is signed by several Nobel Prize winners. And you get an invitation to the ceremony held in this building. It's called Sanders Theater. It's the oldest and largest meeting place at Harvard University in the US. It fits 1,200 people. It's always jammed to the gills on Ig Nobel night. It's televised live, uh, webcast on the internet. Reporters come from around the world. Uh, and up on stage, waiting to hand the Ig Nobel Prizes to the winners and shake their hands, are several people who have Nobel Prizes. And the heart of the ceremony is when we announce each of the winners. And they're kept strictly secret until that moment. And it's the 10 times during the night when we announce a new winner, a winner steps out, and a Nobel laureate steps out, and they come to center stage, look each other in the eye, and neither one can quite believe it. <laughs> and because it's a ceremony with many people who have to give speeches, we used to run into the problem. Those of you who've been to one of these talks before know, we used to have the same problem everybody else has. Everyone wants to say a few extra words, and the night gets longer and longer. And we solve that by recruiting a very cute eight-year-old girl who we call Miss Sweetie Poo. And Miss Sweetie Poo sits on the side of the stage. I introduce her at the start of the ceremony. And I explain that uh, whenever Miss Sweetie Poo feels that somebody has talked long enough, she will let them know. And 
I ask her to demonstrate. Um, we have with us tonight a Miss Sweetie Poo, and we will be using her to help our speakers each keep their talks to the uh, appointed time. And you'll see the details of that mechanism in a bit. Uh, just show you a couple of Sweetie Poo pictures. We have to get a new one every year. <laughs> most of the girls decline our request to remain eight years old for much longer than a year. Uh, this is a photo from a couple years ago, Miss Sweetie Poo uh, helping the Ig Nobel Medicine Prize winner from that year to finish his speech on time. We tell the winners at the ceremony, you get to talk longer than anyone else. You get about one minute. This is Dr. Francis Fesmeyer. Dr. Fesmeyer won his prize because he invented the first known reliable cure for intractable hiccups. That's the kind of hiccups that go on for days and weeks and months. His cure he calls digital rectal massage. <laughs> Here's a quick look at the most recent crop of Ig Nobel winners. Oh, and before I do that, let me introduce to you very briefly, just I'll ask each of our speakers tonight to just stand and take a bow, and, and you'll, you'll get some more detail from them in a bit who they are. Um, first, Charles Spence. Marie Christine Carrierg. Mahmoud Bhutta. David Sims. John Hoyland. Case Muliker. Chris McManus. Erwin Campagni, Fiona Barclay, Piers Barnes, and Dan Meyer. All right, you'll meet them in a bit. First, a look at the most recent crop of Ig Nobel winners. The Ig Nobel Physics Prize was awarded to two scientists from Southern California for proving mathematically that heaps of string or hair or almost anything else will inevitably tangle themselves up in knots. Here is the study they published called Spontaneous Knotting of an Agitated String. And here's one of the winners uh, at the Ig Nobel ceremony emerging from the sacred curtain. And he's about to have his hand shaked by William Lipscomb who won the 1976 Nobel Chemistry Prize. And here is a <laughs> photograph from their study. <laughs> the Cognitive Science Prize, the first time we've given a prize in this field, went to a team of five Japanese scientists and one Hungarian scientist. They were honored for discovering that slime molds can solve puzzles. <laughs> this is their study called Maze Solving by an Amoeboid Organism. And here are three of the team who flew from Japan to deliver a one-minute acceptance speech, <laughs> most of which took the form of a song, as it turned out. <laughs> this is from their study. This is the maze they used. That was the puzzle. And the yellow. Is, uh, is slime mold. At the beginning, they put slime mold in the entire maze. And here you can see these things labeled AG. That's where they put some food at the two entry points. And the slime mold, over the course of the next several hours, solved a problem that mathematicians really wrestle with for this kind of thing, which is figuring out what is the shortest path through the maze from one of those points to the other. And you can see that. The slime mold handle that no sweat. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Economics Prize was awarded to three scientists from the University of New Mexico for discovering that professional lap dancers <laughs> earn higher tips when they are ovulating. 
This is their study called Ovulatory Cycle Effects on Tip Earnings by Lap Dancers, Economic Evidence for Human Estrus, question mark. And here are two of the three scientists at the Ig Nobel ceremony accepting their prize. Um, you see to the left of them, projected behind them and above them was a giant image of a graph that's from their study. Here's a closer look at it. This, these two lines show the difference in earnings between lap dancers who are ovulating and lap dancers who are not. You can see it's dramatic. <laughs> I see some nodding heads and I'm not. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Nutrition Prize was awarded to Max Zampini of the University of Trento, Italy, and Charles Spence of Oxford University for electronically modifying the sound of a potato crisp to make the person chewing the crisp believe it to be crisper and fresher than it really is. Here's their study called The Role of Auditory Cues in Modulating the Perceived Crispness and Staleness of Potato Chips. And here is Max Zampini. Um, this photo was taken a few weeks after the Ig Nobel ceremony at a, another little ceremony related that we had in Italy. And uh, Charles Spence is here and will speak to you in a bit. I'll just, add, for the moment, ask Charles to yet again take a, stand up and turn around, take a quick bow. <laughs> this is what they used for the crisps. And this is a photo of <laughs> what the work looked like while it was being performed. The Ig Nobel Peace Prize, which many consider to be the most prestigious of the Ig Nobel Prizes, was awarded to the Swiss Federal Ethics Committee on Non-Human Biotechnology and to all the citizens of Switzerland <laughs> for adopting the legal principle that plants have dignity. <laughs> this is a book, fairly thick, that attempts to explain what this means and how the citizens of the nation of Switzerland uh, are expected to apply it to their daily life. The <laughs> quick version of what happened was this got into the legal system indirectly and unexpectedly. Some wording for something else was put in, and then it was realized that our legal system now says plants have dignity and we must enforce this. No one really knew what to do, so they formed this committee, charged them with figuring out how, what it means and how to explain it to the rest of the, the country, and they produced that book. Here is the chairman of the committee, the man on the left, at the Ig Nobel Prize ceremony, accepting his prize. And here are a few instances of the collision or intersection of dignity and plants. <laughs> the Ig Nobel Archaeology Prize was awarded to three Brazilian scientists for measuring how the course of history, or at least the contents of an archaeological dig site, can be scrambled by the actions of a live armadillo. This is the published study of the role of armadillos in the movement of archaeological materials and experimental approach. You might consider this finding the next time you read any report of an archaeologist explaining anything based on a dig. The Ig Nobel Biology Prize was awarded to Marie-Christine Carrier, Christelle Joubert, and Michel Franck of the École Nationale Vétérinaire in Toulouse, France, for discovering that the fleas that live on a dog can jump higher than the fleas that live on a cat. Here's their study, a comparison of jump performances of the dog flea and the cat flea. And here are two of the authors this, too, was uh, taken a month after the Ig Nobel ceremony at a related ceremony we held in Genoa, Italy. In fact, this was in the Ducal Palace, quite a magnificent structure in Italy. And Marie-Christine Cadierg is with us tonight and will explain her work. And if I could ask her again to just stand up briefly and take a bow. <laughs> we'll meet her in a bit. Here's just a, an advanced peek at some of their data. The Ig Nobel Medicine Prize was awarded to a team of four researchers in the US and Singapore 
for demonstrating that high-priced fake medicine is more effective than <laughs> low-priced fake medicine. Their study is called Commercial Features of Placebo and Therapeutic Efficacy. And here is Dan Ariely, the lead author, giving an impassioned one-minute acceptance speech at the ceremony. The Ig Nobel Literature Prize is awarded to Professor David Sims of Cass Business School here in London for his lovingly written study called <laughs> You Bastard, a narrative exploration of the experience of indignation within organizations. <laughs> uh, this is the study itself, or the beginning of it. And here is Professor Sims at the Ig Nobel ceremony about to receive his prize. You also see the man on the right here is Dan Meyer, uh, a winner the previous year of the Medicine Prize, uh, who we, the, the winners have a standing invitation to please come back to any ceremony in the future you like. And, and, and the audience is always very, very happy to see them come back, with one or two exceptions. And Dan Meyer also is with us tonight. And you'll be meeting both of them. If I ask David to just again stand up and take a bow. Thank you. And the Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize was awarded this time around to three American scientists for discovering that Coca Cola is an effective <laughs> spermicide. They shared the prize with three scientists, three doctors in Taiwan, who read the first group's study, decided to do their own experiment, and discovered that, no, it's not. <laughs> this is the original study. It's called The Effect of Coke on Sperm Motility. Here is the rejoinder study a year later, the spermicidal potency of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. You can see the second group decided to expand the scope of the research. Uh, here is Dr. Deborah Anderson. This is, this is the lead author on the first study. And this is the person probably most responsible for this research happening at all. And you see her here at the Ig Nobel ceremony uh, giving her acceptance speech. During our little intermission tonight, one of the little videos uh, that you see, uh, which, which are uh, comprised of little, almost random segments of various uh, things put together. One of them uh, it features a piece of the speech she gave right after the Ig Nobel ceremony explaining this. And also at the ceremony accepting the prize was the daughter of the lead researcher from the Taiwanese group. The, the Taiwanese researchers couldn't travel that week, but the lead author sent his daughter. Here she is. And she said she and her father both wanted the audience to know that she was conceived the same year her father did that research. <laughs> and they both wanted to express their deep gratitude to the Coca-Cola company. <laughs> At this point in the ceremony, we brought out some Coca-Cola, and all of the distinguished scientists on stage raised their glasses and drank a toast to Coca-Cola. Um, I'll just point out one of them. The man in the middle here in the dark suit is uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. Some of you know of his work. He's a mathematician. And Benoit Mandelbrot is the inventor of the mathematical concept of fractals. And uh, he enjoyed toasting Coca-Cola. <laughs> Speaking of which, <laughs> if I could ask uh, some of our winners in the front row to help with us, um, maybe we have if we could uh, count how many glasses there are. Six, seven? We could have six or seven volunteers to come down and just drink a, a sip or two of Coca-Cola and help us celebrate this great scientific discovery. OK. And each of these glasses is being poured and handed to you by an Ig Nobel Prize winner. Are we toasting? Are we toasting? No, no, you're handing, you're handing the glasses. Unless you want to share glasses, that's perfectly fine. I mean, to drink the Coca-Cola. Okay. So very quickly, but very deeply felt, uh, please raise your glasses. And a toast to Coca-Cola. <laughs> and while you're digesting that, 
if we could have the lights down again. Good technology night on the machine. Coca-Cola. <laughs> and just very, very quickly, a, a glimpse at a few other things that happened during the Ig Nobel ceremony. As many of you know, we always have a win a date with a Nobel laureate contest. Each of the 1,200 people who buys a ticket has a chance to win a date. Uh, here's a winner collecting her prize. This was two years ago. <laughs> this was last year at the ceremony. That's Professor Lipscomb, who you saw before, who's 90 years old, by the way, and still going strong. <laughs> And since Benoit Mandelbrot was at the ceremony this year, we had a win a date with Benoit Mandelbrot contest. And there's the winner. <laughs> and each year we write a little opera, mini opera, about some topic in science. Uh, in fact, the same topic that's the theme of the ceremony. This year the theme was redundancy, and our mini opera was called Redundancy Again. <laughs> this is the previous year. Our theme was chicken. And a really quick look at a few previous winners. Uh, two doctors a few years ago won an Ig Nobel Prize for discovering why woodpeckers don't get headaches. <laughs> Case Muliker, who you're going to meet later tonight, uh, won his prize for an observation he made. Uh, and he wrote it down. It became the first scientifically recorded case of homosexual necrophilia in the mallard duck. If I could ask Case to just quickly stand and turn around and take a bow. <laughs> 2001, we gave an Ig Nobel Prize jointly to a man named John Keogh, who lives in Australia, and to the Australian Patent Office, because in that year, 2001, the, the Patent Office granted Mr. Keogh a patent for the wheel. <laughs> this is a technical drawing from the patent. And finally, the previous year, the Ig Nobel Psychology Prize went to the two co-authors of this study called Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. <laughs> Let me read that again. <laughs> Unskilled and Unaware of It, How Difficulties in Recognizing One's Own Incompetence Lead to Inflated Self-Assessments. So that's a quick look at the Ig Nobel Prizes and the most recent winners, a few of whom you will meet tonight. Now we're going to start having our speakers. Each of them will speak for five minutes, and then we'll take a maximum of two questions. If you ask a question, uh, we have people in the audience with, um, with microphones who will come up to you. So, so when it comes question time, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and wave so we, we can see you. And then please wait before you speak until the microphone reaches you. To help us, to help the, the speakers uh, keep to the, the allotted time of five minutes each, we have a sort of two-part mechanism here. Uh, part one consists of a timekeeper over here who is equipped with a bell and a wristwatch. You have a wristwatch on you? And you know how to tell time? OK. And uh, we also have Miss Sweetie Poo. And uh, first of all, I'm going to explain the, the uh, bell part of this. I would ask the timekeeper, when each speaker begins, pay close attention to the time. At the end of one minute, if you could hit the bell once. At the end of two minutes, hit it twice. At the end of three minutes, three times. At the end of four minutes, four times. And you're a professor here, is that correct? <laughs> At the end of five minutes, 
Just keep hitting it. <laughs> At the end of five minutes, two things will happen. One is our timekeeper will start hitting the bell continuously. The other is Miss Sweetie Pooh will come over and explain that she feels that somebody has talked long enough. So I would like to ask Miss Sweetie Pooh to demonstrate what she'll do in that case. Um, so remember again, this will happen only if somebody exceeds their time limit. And then Miss Sweetie Pooh will. I'm full. Please stop. I'm full. Please stop. Thank you. So I, I hope this will help us uh, <laughs> help the speakers keep to time. Our first speaker is Charles Spence, who won an Ig Nobel Prize this past year. And I would like you to welcome him. <laughs> OK. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, our research, uh, playing with the sound of Pringles that we did in Oxford a couple of years ago together with Max Zampini, who you saw a little earlier. I was a psychologist or neuroscientist interested in the brain and perception and how our brain combines all the different senses, what we see and hear and smell, taste and touch, how our brain combines all those sensory cues to give us the rich perceptions that fill our daily life, be that for sort of household products or more recently, for the case of food and drink, which is perhaps the most multi-sensory of all our experiences and something we all do every day. Um, and our work uh, was looking at how you can change people's perception of food by understanding those rules uh, of the brain. And we've seen lots of people have thought about hearing, uh, sorry, smell and taste. Lots of people have thought about changing the color of food and how you can make food look disgusting or very appealing by changing it to blue or another color. Uh, but no one had ever looked at uh, what role sound plays in uh, modulating or changing your perception of the food that you eat. So we thought that was worthy of study. Um, and to that end, we designed a setup like the one you see here, where we have subjects uh, wearing some headphones with a microphone. And our subjects can eat a variety of foods. And the microphone placed by their mouth will pick up the sound as they bite into each food, uh, play around with it with some computer gubbins, and then play it back over the headphones somewhat altered, and our subjects trying to judge just how good that food uh, tastes. And this is the research that we won the Ig Nobel Prize for this year. Uh, here are us on the cover of um, the Annals of Improbable Research. Here we have two sample stimuli, similar to the ones that our subjects used, one from a freshly opened packet of Pringles, one from a packet uh, about four days old. So we'd like to <laughs> hand those out. Uh, and you two can take part in the same sort of research that, that we've been doing in Oxford, not in the gold soundproof booth, the smallest of our um, experimental testing cubicles. Here you see Max Zampini with the headphones biting into a Pringle with a microphone picking up the sound. It goes out of the box, we change it, and it comes back in. Uh, and on each trial, the experiment will open the door, feed the subjects a Pringle, they bite into that Pringle over the microphone, and then depending on how hungry they are, uh, they can choose to eat each one, or they might spit it out in the spittoon here. I should say, in, in the benefits of uh, good scientific research, uh, we get our subjects, each one, to eat 180 Pringles, one after the other. Some fresh, some stale, so they're doing a real sensible task. And then they rate uh, the Pringle on a, uh, using foot pedals below them. So here we have Max in action, uh, using Pringles. Why Pringles? Well, these are kind of great experimental stimuli, because every single one is identical in shape, in texture, and in size. So we know if you rate this Pringle better than one in that packet, it's all down to what you heard, and not at all to do with uh, differences between one Pringle and the next. Uh, and Max doesn't actually hear the Pringles uh, from the headphones where the sound comes from, but in fact, because of the ventriloquism effect, like when you go to the cinema, you, you hear the voices from the lips on the screen, Max also is experiencing the crisp sounds from in his mouth and not from his ears. The sounds get ventriloquized into his mouth. Um, and for each crisp, he's having to rate it as sort of stale and horrible or nice and crispy, uh, using foot pedals to move this bar along the screen. And each time we'll change the sound and see what influence it has on uh, our subjects, about 20 of them, on their perception of crispness. And what we find is that the louder the crisp biting sound, the more pleasant and crispy the crisp will taste. So the reason not to bite into Pringles at a noisy party, they won't taste so good. Um, and also, engineers have looked into the precise frequency of sound that's given off when you bite into a Pringle, which turns to be, out to be at 5,000 hertz, 
And if you boost the sound at that frequency, you'll get the most crispy uh, Pringles uh, of all. And from this research, uh, we've kind of gone on to think about, <laughs> it makes you think twice about why you see some uh, crisp manufacturers putting uh, ears on their uh, crisp packets. But also you might wonder, why is it that so many crisp packets come in these noisy packets? Why couldn't somebody just design something that's silent? We've been to the engineers to ask, is there something necessary about this packaging uh, to preserve the crisps? It turns out, no, there's no good reason to have crisps in this sort of noisy packet. And what we think is going on is that uh, some marketeer some time ago has had the good idea that maybe if you're eating a noisy food, the best way to build up expectation to, in, to really make sure that people enjoy the food is to have a noisy package, and that noisy package will get you in the mood for the noisy food that's about to come. Uh, we also tried to apply this research, uh, not just for food companies, and now Nestle, Unilever, Procter & Gamble are all doing their own research in-house on crisps, on biscuits, on cereals, uh, to try and enhance the sound of the food that you uh, and I eat. But we've also worked together with Heston Blumenthal at the Fat Duck restaurant in Bray, uh, not so far from here. And this was our first attempt to try and bring sound into the dining experience in the Fat Duck restaurant. Here with a... <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> And here's the dish. Charles Spence. What? While. Uh... While we're, we're taking the questions, if I could ask a couple of you in the front to maybe go around and pass out some more of these. Okay. All right. These are experimental materials from the laboratory, but they are safe. They're safe. Um, now, now, if any of you have any questions, <laughs> if there's anyone who has a question and is polite. <laughs> Do you have a question, sir? I do indeed. Uh, I must state ta it, please. What? Please state your question. <laughs> I have to take very serious issue with your claim for novelty here. It is, in fact, a well-developed subject. And also, there's a branch of mathematics specifically devoted to this task. But in the current context, I take special exception I don't know whether our colleagues in the EG committees have looked at precedent, but my recollection is about three or four years ago, they gave a similar award for looking at the acoustic emission of cornflakes. Now, I happen to remember this because it made the Sir, times. Let me, let me repeat my, what I said before. If you have a question, this would be a good time to ask it. <laughs> my question is... Remember... <laughs> yes? They're not good for you, these <laughs> snacks. My question is that in research you can have fun, of course, but are you happy with the idea of claiming precedent when you have no such thing, even in the jest of this? Thank you for the this? question. How would you reply to this? <laughs> uh, so it's true that engineers have looked at the sounds that given off when various crispy materials are broken into but no one has ever done a psychological study of uh, crispness perception by changing the sound cues. Um, and in terms of the uh, breakfast cereal, that's an interesting one. But again, it's just sort of marketeers hearsay uh, and the attempt by Kellogg's who actually tried to uh, trademark the sound of Kellogg's crisps when milk's poured into the bowl at breakfast time, saying they had the signature sound uh, that no other manufacturer uh, had. Yeah. That, uh, the, the <laughs> uh, wait, ask that in a moment. When, a ask that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> On this question, about two, 12 years ago, uh, the Ig Nobel Physics Prize went to a team of three scientists in Norwich who explored the physics of how breakfast cereal flakes become soggy. Now, they did not 
center on, and, and I'm not sure they even directly address the question of sound. Now, maybe they had intended to, and they missed the chance to get two Ig Nobels, but that's how it goes in science. <laughs> okay. Now, if somebody could get a microphone over here to this gentleman so you could ask your question. How do you uh, if you could wait till the <laughs> <laughs> microphone. And so we are dealing with sound here in the question, too, though, so we don't want to ironically not have the sound of your wonderful question reach the ears of the audience. Your crispy question, I'm sure. Go ahead. Well, it was more of a heckle, really. How did you demonstrate and prove that Pringles were standardized? Uh, we didn't, uh, but... but <laughs> <laughs> so an assumption in our research, uh, but for each of the nine different kinds of sounds that people would hear in the, in the, in the, in the original research, uh, people would eat about 20 different Pringles for each sound variety. So we're sure even if one Pringles had a slightly different, in fact, that would average out over the kind of 20 repetitions of each Pringle by each sound in the study. Good. Charles Spence. And this is, a, this is a good point. I'm not sure that work has been done by anyone. If somebody would like to do the research on that and submit it to the Annals of Improbable Research, we'd love to consider it for publication. Our next speaker won an Ig Nobel Prize this year. I, you've, you've seen just very briefly an outline of her work. Um, here she is herself. Marie-Christine Cadier. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I will try to tell you within the, the few next minutes before this little girl stops me, uh, why in 2000, uh, whilst there were the Olympic Games in Sydney, we in Toulouse organized a major flea competition between two teams, the dog flea team on your left and the cat flea team on your right. And we compare their jumping performances. More seriously, uh, this um, study was part of a large research project aiming to better understand flea biology and to compare these two species. Uh, so the dog flea, which is found only on dogs, and which is pretty rare, and the cat flea here, uh, which is much more common, and which is found on cats, and despite its name, on dogs. How did we organize our competition? Uh, for the long jump, instead of having sand, we used a large piece of sticky paper. <laughs> we placed two fleas on a non-sticky area in the center and let them jump without any run approach. And uh, of course, because the paper was sticky, once landed, they couldn't take off again. <laughs> so we could easily measure their jump. And we measured their first jump for uh, 450 fleas per team. What about the eye jump? We didn't have any horizontal bar. We used plastic cylinders of increasing sizes from one centimeter to 30 centimeters. And we put uh, uh, 10 fleas inside each cylinder and counted how many could escape. <laughs> we, <laughs> we repeated that uh, five times per cylinder and per species. Which one did win for the long jump? The dog flea did, with an average jump of 30.4 centimeter and a record of 50 centimeters. The cat flea here wasn't far behind for the, the record, uh, but the mean jump was much shorter. And as you can see, for the high jump, the gold medal went again to the dog B. With 50% of the team passing 15.5 centimeters. And the French record for fleas, 25 centimeters. 
despite the fun of it, we uh, had new information about uh, flea biology. And even if these specific uh, uh, new information weren't uh, as useful as you might think, uh, others were. And uh, knowing better about fleas means that we can better control them and we can provide more comfort to our pets. <laughs> That's the, the aim of the, of the study. Um, unfortunately, we didn't manage to understand why the dog flea was so rare compared to the cat flea. As, in fact, in all the experiments we conducted, uh, the, cat flea, the dog flea was much better uh, than the, the cat flea. And just to uh, finish, um, remember I said it was in 2000 uh, and there were the Sydney Olympic Games. If the competitors in Sydney had benefited from the flea capabilities, here are the performances they would have had. 450 meters for the long jump, 240 meters for the high jump. Of course, this uh, uh, scaling up isn't accurate, and these data are false. But this gives you an idea of what we can get with fleas. Thank you. Marie-Christine Cadier. Questions? Questions? You raise your arm and shout or something. It's a little difficult to see from here. Yes, in the front row, in the middle there. And wait, wait until the uh, microphone reaches you. Unless you're an opera singer. <laughs> what I wanted to ask is, do big dogs have longer-legged fleas than little dogs? No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> um, but uh, what I can say is that um, dogs who live in cold areas get more dog fleas than dogs who live in warm areas. Don't know why. <laughs> and one more question. Back up in the middle. You're wrestling with the microphone? It's on. Uh, yeah, did you look at uh, motivation and desire? <laughs> well, fleas were not trained before, and we tried not to motivate them. Uh, as far as our motivation uh, was concerned, I, didn't, I wouldn't say anything. <laughs> You, you say you tried not to motivate them. How does one avoid motivating a flea? Well, you can motivate a flea by uh, just breathing and, uh, uh, above it. So we had to... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Marie-Christine Carrier. <laughs> Our next speaker is a physician who lives in Oxford. Uh, he has some research published recently that he's going to describe to us tonight. Here is Dr. Mahmoud Bhutta. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm uh, undertaking some research at Oxford now, but I'm going to talk to you about a study that I uh, undertook when I was working as a doctor in Brighton. Uh, basically, it's to do with tonsillitis, which is a very common infection of the throat. Um, it, we see this. This is a picture of tonsillitis. So the glands that are in the back of the mouth, and the infection may spread from the tonsils to cause something called peritonsillitis or peritonsillar abscess, which is pus around the tonsils. What they say about peritonsillitis in all the textbooks is that it's said to present with a hot potato voice. So people speak as if they've got a hot potato inside their mouth. <laughs> However, <laughs> my colleagues and I thought that this was probably wrong because if you look at the tonsils, they're, they're at the throat really and a hot potato would probably go inside your mouth and we thought that maybe that these things weren't quite exactly the same. 
So I'm afraid I have to give you a little bit of background science. If you talk about how we generate sound, it's generated in the voice box or the larynx. You create a column of vibrating air. And then what happens is that you send it through a resonating chamber, which is made up of your throat, your mouth, and your nose. And by changing the characteristics of that resonating chamber, by moving the soft palate, which is a dangly thing at the back of your mouth, um, the tongue, the jaws, and the lips, you alter the sound. In particular, the palate opens and closes whether you let air into the, into the nose. So you basically end up with a whole load of vibrating columns of air, and um, you end up with something called formant frequency. So if I go back, you can see that there's a, a tube, and you have these um, sort of vibrations that are related to the size of the tube, um, and you have various frequencies that are brought through particularly well. So uh, we have formant frequencies, are these frequencies, and F1 and F2, which are the first two, particularly characterize the sounds that produced. And what we find is that's actually an error. The F1 actually increases with decreasing cross-sectional area of the track, and the F2 particularly increases with the increasing constriction point. Now, when we're looking at this sound, this is a good way of analysing it, using these form and frequencies, and particularly looking at very nice, clean sounds, such as E, R, U. So uh, this is what we did. So if you look at E, we know that the structure of the, the, the throat, if this is the head cut in half, this is what it looks like. Um, and you, you have this particular characteristic that defines a sound E. This is a characteristic that defines a sound R. And this is the characteristics that define a sound U. So what did we do? Well, we took six patients who had peritonsillitis, and we measured their form and frequencies, saying E, R, and U. And uh, we measured it again when they got a bit better to compare the changes that they'd had. I took uh, six uh, healthy volunteers. Um, <laughs> dragged along and told that they were going to have a hot potato <laughs> put inside their mouth, warmed in a microwave. <laughs> and having measured their sound, we measured it again without a potato inside the mouth. <laughs> so what did we find? Well, those who've got this peritonsillitis, when you look at it statistically, what actually changes is there's a change in E, there's a change in the F1 frequency. When there's a change with the R, there's a change in the F2 frequency. Um, when you start to think about why this might be, we actually sort of surmise that it's due to some of the muscles around the tonsils just not working very well when they're surrounded by inflammation. Here we can see that E, the F1, will decrease because the palate is not being held up by this muscle called levator veli palatini. And when you're saying R, the F2 increases because this muscle palatoglossus, which is near the tonsil again, is not holding the palate and the tongue close together. However, when you look at a hot potato, <laughs> what you find is that the changes that are statistically significant are really uh, in when you articulate E. And uh, the reason for that is because the E sound particularly relies on putting the tongue very close to the roof of your mouth. And if you've got a potato lying on top of your tongue, <laughs> it's actually quite difficult to oppose those two surfaces. So what you find is that the F1 decreases because you've got a big, wide oral cavity, and the F2 increases because that constriction point has gone. So in conclusion, uh, in peritonsillitis, there is an alteration in F1 articulating E and an increase in F2 articulating R, and that is because of dysfunction of the muscles around the tonsils. In hot potato voice, however, there's a change in the tongue structure, and both F1 and F2 change when articulating E, and basically... Uh, the changes that occur with peritonsillitis should not be called a hot potato voice because they are completely different. Mahmoud <laughs> Buta. Before we take two questions, I, I feel compelled to observe, we've had two speakers from Oxford. Both of them have done their research with potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, please, for Dr. Buta. Um, do you have any suggestions of terms your colleagues should use instead of hot potato voice? <laughs> uh, no, not really, I'm afraid. <laughs> I suppose you call, could cause it levator veli palatini dysfunction, but uh, not quite as catchy, I would say. 
Uh, how hot exactly is a hot potato? <laughs> So if you refer to my publication in the Journal of Voice, you will see <laughs> that they were warmed to a hot but not uncomfortable temperature. <laughs> Dr. Mahmoud Bouta, thank you. If you have additional questions for any of the speakers, almost all of them and I will be at the reception right across the hall afterwards. So don't forget your questions if you don't get a chance to ask them here. Our next speaker was awarded the Ig Nobel Literature Prize recently. He is here at Cass Business School in London. Please welcome Professor David Sims. I should explain that when you send a paper off to a journal and you get to go through the revisions, it never occurs to you they're not going to change the title, does it? <laughs> but they didn't. I should also assure you that absolutely no bastards were injured during my research at any point. What this work is about is I, I'm intrigued with the way people get angry with each other, including good, liberal-minded, right-thinking people like ourselves, and we realize that different people see things differently, and they'll see the world differently, and that'll be why they disagree with us. And then in the end, we snap, and we just say, you bastard, <laughs> because uh, we've run out of patience with them. My work starts from assumption of, of homo narrans narrata. We, we all tell stories. That's what most of us do for our living. And we all are stories. So one of the stories we tell most frequently is the story of ourselves, because it's such an interesting story. And we build characters for ourselves, and we develop those characters over time. And uh, when we look at other people's characters, just like the audiences for a soap opera, we decide that some people are being completely slippery. If, if someone changes too rapidly, we don't believe in them. If someone doesn't change at all, we get bored of them very quickly. Uh, and again, we don't actually believe what's going on. So we all develop, we all change the characters that we tell our stories in, but not in a straight line. We all develop in what's called a narrative arc in, in literary studies. Uh, so you don't just develop directly, you develop in a, by a roundabout means. On the other hand, if anybody actually here does develop directly, I'd be really interested to hear from you afterwards and perhaps do a case study on you. So we develop in this, this narrative arc. And we build and maintain characters. We build up a, an image of, what, of how we expect to come across to other people. Uh, characters have consistency and development. And our characterizations of people can be relatively simple, like hero, villain, and fool. We don't actually have that much subtlety the way we do it. But unlike the person watching the soap opera, we don't simply watch each other. We actually make guest appearances in each other's lives. We appear in other people's stories. We appear as a character in other people's stories. And not only that, but our stories intertwine. Uh, sometimes you'll find that two people's stories actually get connected with each other. They intertwine. And I, I should explain, because I know this is a very science and engineering-based place, that that is what's otherwise known as love. <laughs> so love is when you let your story intertwine with someone else's stories. Their story becomes part of your story. Uh, as in the well-known phrase, darling, can we intertwine our stories? <laughs> Sometimes misunderstood. <laughs> On some occasions, the people who make guest appearances in our lives actually change a bit too quickly. Uh, they do something we don't expect. They do something which is inexplicable for the character we have for them, and that is when we tend to label them as, you bastard. So I've done a typology of bastards. And I have three main kinds. I have the clever bastard, who is the person who walks off with all your money when you didn't know about it. And by the time you realize that they're a bastard, they've disappeared with a paycheck. Then there's the bastard ex machina, who is the person who you can really trust until you need them when they've suddenly disappeared off the scene altogether. Uh, many of us have worked for the bastard ex machina at some stage of our lives. And then we have the devious bastard, who's just out to screw you every way they can. <laughs> The problem with these people is not just that they behave badly, but also we don't really like dismissing people that way. It's not what you do, is it? You have to need to understand people. So if they actually push you into calling them a bastard, then they really must be a bastard. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't have put you in that awful spot where you actually have to categorize them that way, which is an embarrassing and dispiriting sort of thing to do. So they force us into that. 
So we become angry because someone is being despicable and because they're no, giving us no choice about actually saying something about them which is over dismissive to ourselves. I have to say that when I did this uh, research in the first place, like we usually do, I took it on tour to a number of different universities and did seminars, and everybody thought I collected my data in their own institution. <laughs> but without bastards, we would be stuffed. We actually need bastards, just in the same way as St. George needed the dragon, because St. George would not exist now had he not had a dragon to work with. And in the same way, how can we actually justify high salaries, the kind, of, the kind of pay that senior people get in organizations, unless you've got some bastards to deal with. And that will actually protect your salary like nothing else will. So under those circumstances, under the circumstances when someone doesn't behave in the way you expect, what can you say but, you bastard. Thank you. <laughs> David Sim. Questions? You choose. I can't see anybody. <laughs> you choose at random. Yeah, OK. Well, choose someone to ask a question. Okay. Yeah, let's point somewhere. Way up the back there. Um, was it mostly, what about the most highly paid people? Were they most typically the bastards, or? Were they sorting out the bastards? Were they paid because they were sorting out the bastards? Yeah. Uh, they, 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 were, they were paid a lot because they were sorting out the bastards, but that's what they said. Uh, <laughs> so, so bastards tend to be pretty much in the eye of the beholder, don't they? Uh, so, so from the other side, you'd have found someone else who could say that they were the bastard because they were sorting me out, and they shouldn't have been sorting me out. They should have been sorting out the person next to me. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pleasure. Uh, Here. Yeah. Can you say something about uh, the data you collected? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the data was collected in a number of institutions, and of course I then had to protect the guilty for all I was worth. Uh, and when I actually wrote the paper, I, I elided cases so that uh, I, I didn't think you could recognize the, the, the particular case that I was using. As I said, I, my intention was that no bastard should actually be hurt in the conduct of this research. Um, now, having done that, the data were recognized, and everybody knew who I was talking about. It's just that quite often I'd never heard of the people they thought were definitely the data, where the data came from. <laughs> what can you do? David Sims. Our next speaker created and edits the column called Feedback in New Scientist magazine. He's one of the world's great collectors of real and odd, and I mean things that are both of those, phenomenon. Here is John Hoyland. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Am I switched on? Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, when a flock of Canada, Canada geese forced a US Airways jet to ditch in the Hudson River, one aspect of the story received scant attention in the media, and that was the geese. There's been a distinct, lack, a distinct lack of sympathy and understanding for those birds. Think of it. You're flying along happily, thinking of just minding your own business, and then suddenly you find yourself inside a jet engine. <laughs> we decided to try and find out more about this, so we went to the Federal Aviation Administration's National Wildlife Strike Database, and it made disturbing reading. We found 1,266 reports of aeroplanes hitting Canada geese between 1990 and 2008. Even more shocking, planes hit 9,843 gulls in the same period, 145 bald eagles and 15 black-capped chickadees were also hit by planes. Then we came to the entry for turtles. <laughs> now, now you may not think that turtles and aeroplanes are likely to run into each other very often, uh, but you'd be wrong. No less than 80 turtles were hit by aeroplanes in this period. Also upsetting are the figures for armadillos. Uh, planes struck 14 armadillos in Florida, two in Louisiana and one in Oklahoma. In addition, 13 American alligators were hit by planes in Florida. 
By now, we'd come to suspect that these animals were not actually flying <laughs> when they met the planes. We think they were on the ground. The same is probably true of 146 skunks, 33 dogs, 18 cats, five horses, and one single unfortunate pig. <laughs> now, that story has a strongly American flavour, but as this is mainly British audience tonight, I'd like to move on to, to the topic of Marmite. <laughs> marmite is a condiment that's loved by many British people and that everyone else thinks is disgusting. <laughs> uh, I'm British and I admit I like Marmite, but I'm put off by the statement that the mar Marmite marketing department has put on the label. It says 100% vegetarian. Now that is really silly. If it was anything less than 100%, it wouldn't be vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. You don't go around saying it's 90% vegetarian, you know. <laughs> So it really is vegetarian, apart from the bits of meat in it. <laughs> Silly, yeah? Um, and here's, here's another bit of marketing silliness. One thing marketing people sometimes do when they want to make a product seem exciting is to print trivia questions on the packaging. And an Australian reader wrote, wrote to say that he found one of these on a brand of ice cream called a Paddle Pop. And it said, did you know that cows are herbivores for most of the year? Now, the reader wanted to know what time of year they become carnivores. <laughs> and should he worry about this? So, uh, those two stories were sent in unsolicited by readers. And here's another on a different topic that arrived the other day. A reader told us on the main staircase of the University of Tasmania that a notice that says, Welcome to the School of Maths and Physics. You are on level two. Level three is one floor up. <laughs> OK, um, sometimes readers send us in pictures as well as stories, and here are a few I think you might like. That's on a lid of a very long-lasting tub of bicarbonate of soda. <laughs> um, robots need not apply. And this one is for people who live in a world of holograms, <laughs> or think they do. Finally, this one says, live rainbow trout. <laughs> but you could have fooled me. And this is finally uh, a village in Hampshire. <laughs> but why bother? OK, I'd like to finish with two nominations for the best scientific paper title of the year. The first is from the Journal of the Royal Army Medical Corps, and it's called Effects of Nuclear Weapons on the Gastrointestinal System. <laughs> and the reader who sent this in uh, suggested they'd probably be large and mainly negative. <laughs> and the second... The second is a paper called, believe it or not, Cutting Off the Nose to Save the Penis. And this was a paper about bicycling policemen. Now, a study found that the high, there was a high incidence of erectile dysfunction and numbness of the groin among policemen riding on traditional bicycle saddles. But if researchers cut the nose off the saddle, saddle there was a significant improvement in pe penile sensitivity and erectile function. So next time you see a policeman on a bicycle, <laughs> ask him if he's cut his nose off yet. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> Wave your arm frantically so we can see you if you're asking a question, please. Or, or make a sound. Can I ask myself a question? <laughs> wave, wave your arm first. Yes. I want to ask John if, um, John, um, have you got anything more to tell us about the aeroplanes hitting wildlife? And the answer is yes, I have. Um, <laughs> um, that story is really a story about dead birds. Now, those of you who've seen Case Mollica before know that he's terribly interested in dead birds. And as soon as he heard about this story, or read about it in feedback, he went off to the website to check it out. And we met up uh, on Tuesday at, uh, in Portsmouth University for one of these shows. And Case came up to me and he said, John, John, you missed something. And I said, what? He said, hummingbirds. I said, what do you mean? He said, there were hummingbirds. And <laughs> so I went home and I checked this out. And he's absolutely right. On that database, there are 13 cases of collisions between hum hummingbirds and jet aeroplanes. <laughs> now, how incongruous is that? <laughs> I thought you'd like to know that. <laughs> and uh, question in the front row in the second section. You had your arm up. 
John, do you ride a bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, I don't. I'm not sure I'm going to now either. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank John Harlan. Our next speaker won the 2003 Ig Nobel Biology Prize uh, for an observation that he made, and, uh, and you've, you've heard a little bit about it. He's going to talk a little bit about that and tell us some of the recent things that he's been working on. Here from Rotterdam, the Netherlands, is Kees Mulliker. Being a curator at the Natural History Museum in Rotterdam is a I'm, I'm a lucky curator because uh, I prefer to see the birds like this. And the building uh, I work in I was made of glass and it was a real bird killer. So the only thing I had to do was listen to bangs on, on the window and <laughs> go, go down and pick the birds up and stuff them. Uh, such was the case on June 5th, 1995, five minutes before six o'clock in the evening. And I saw this as a, a mallard who had hit the window, uh, but next to the dead mallard was a live mallard. <laughs> and then this happened. <laughs> the live duck mounted the dead duck. I'm an ornithologist. I said, hey, this is necrophilia. <laughs> then I looked carefully. I saw both of them were of the male sex. <laughs> Homosexual necrophilia. <laughs> it was new to me and new to science. I checked, of course, if the, the, the victim was really of the male sex, and this is a rare picture of a duck's penis. <laughs> this is the paper. Here's my office again. <laughs> this is my office. This is where I hit the window. And here is where I watched it from. <laughs> then my life changed quite a bit. There he is again. I think it's his fourth time here now. <laughs> here it is. There we go. And then, after winning the Ig Nobel Prize in 2003, I've got, had, I've had so many people sending me observations, sending me literature about strange things that happen in animal behavior. And this is the first one I got. This is a case of Davian behavior in squirrels, ground squirrels. And Davian behavior is another word for necrophilia. It came from the US. This is where it came from. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is the victim. This is the stuffed specimen. <laughs> this recently was sent to me from Australia. These are cane toads. <laughs> oh, I don't have to tell you about this. Um, then there was a case of mallards involved in necrophilia. And here are the absolute champions in necrophilic behavior in birds, the swallows. These are barn swallows in Taiwan. Here is a couple of bank swallows in Canada. Here are pigeons in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And here's a case of a black vulture. Um, here it is, um, you can see the vulture here. This is the dead vulture. There's the copulation here again. And here is the proof that it was normal heterosexual necrophilia. This is the ovary of the victim. <laughs> <coughs> and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes things go wrong. This is an, um, this is a moose trying to copulate with a bronze statue of a bison <laughs> uh, up in Vermont. Uh, if you want to read my adventures, uh, I hope it will soon be published in English. <laughs> and uh, you have a, you can all come to Dead Duck Day on June 5th. <laughs> come to Rotterdam to the Natural History Museum and celebrate with us the death of this um, duck, <laughs> this duck, and we try to find new ways to prevent, to prevent birds colliding with um, windows. <laughs> and that's a, that's a big problem. One billion birds a year only in the US die 
uh, because of window collisions. And if I, I have, a, I have more time, okay, I'll go on. <laughs> here, is, here is that duck day, this is what we do. <laughs> and we drink, we drink a beer and we go afterwards, we go to a good Chinese restaurant to have the duck menu. <laughs> It's a big problem. <laughs> Dead Duck Day, June 5th. <laughs> well, something that caught my attention. Um, it's a study done in South Africa in the 70s. It involves bald ibises. And the bald ibises are, well, they are collectors of buttons. <laughs> and here you see. Here you see the buttons, and I, I really want to understand why they collect Please buttons. Stop, I'm okay. Please stop. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, well, your area of study seems to be actually open to opportunities, you know, you need to be opportunistic because at the end of the day, half of your um, subjects need to be dead. Yeah. So can you put your hand on your heart and say that, you know, you actually didn't take that opportunity and, you know, no subjects were hurt during your studies? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, question over here. Uh, hello? Where? Or wherever there's a microphone, if somebody's already got one. Um, in Easter last year, I was very privileged to follow in your kind of uh, bit of research, and I was walking by Lake Windermere with my girlfriend, where we happened to see uh, a mallard duck get hit by a car, at which point another mallard duck came along, and, uh, well, it was a very similar, p uh, similar observation. Uh, I was just wondering if you had any information on the distribution of uh, necrophilic uh, homosexual tendencies of the mallard duck. Where were you at that moment? Uh, Lake Windermere in the Lake District. Okay. Well, that's the f that's, I think it's the first for Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Chase Mulliker. We have five speakers left. I remind you, each speaker gets five minutes maximum. The time limits enforced by our time enforcement crew here. And there will be two questions following each of the lecturers. Our first lecturer won the Ig Nobel, it was, by, by, it was the Biology Prize, correct? Medicine. Medicine Prize. Won the Ig Nobel Medicine Prize several years ago. He is going to tell you briefly, in some cases you know him well, he'll remind you briefly the thing that won him the prize, and then he'll tell you about some of his newer work. From University College London, here is Chris McManus. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, that's the prize. It looked very cheap even then. And that's the paper that won it. Pretty cheap as well. It was published in a pretty cheap journal, and it was published a long while ago. It was published from a pretty strange place, and it was pretty short, 353 words. And it made the cover of Nature. There we go. And that's the best bit about it. It didn't only make the cover of Nature, it actually stimulated a whole lot of correspondence, such as, for instance, this paper. Scrotal Asymmetry and Rodin's Dyslexia, where Michael Morgan, who happened to be my PhD supervisor at the time, it must be said, we should like to see, he mentions that an exception occurs in Rodin's famous sculpture, Lige Darin, where the right testicle of the figure seems to hang lower than the left. We should like to suggest that Rodin was genuinely confused about left and right. There's the sculpture. There's the matter in question. And I really thought this was beyond any further analysis. And a year or two ago, I came across an important piece of primary research data. Oh, I should say, by the way, this did end up in Sued's corner. Not from me, but it did mention me in rather large letters. But the piece of primary research data 
here's the original Belgian soldier that posed for the sculpture. Now, I've looked at this sculpture in immense detail many times. <laughs> I'd like some image processing done on it, because I cannot decide whether or not it's the same way round as the sculpture or not. If anybody can um, peer into the, the gloomy depths and make their mind up, I'd like to know. But I've been told not to talk too much about this topic, so I'm going to talk about right-left confusion in general. And I thought I'd just give you a couple of examples of where right and left get mixed up. And there's three broad ways they do this. Honest error and confusion, incompetence, and brutal intention to deceive. Let me see if I can show you a couple of these very quickly. Firstly, it is very difficult to distinguish right and left. Um, quick, come on, you're all intelligent. Is that a right or a left hand? Come on, come on. Good. Yeah, it's a left one. It's damned hard, actually, in a hurry. People get them mixed up. Here's some Frederick Wood Jones, the anatomist, found some lovely examples. A nice lady standing here in this illustration. You will notice she has a right hand on the end of that left arm. Um, nice Greek lady sitting there, another of his examples. You will notice she has a right foot on the end of the left leg. Um, another one, this is pretty obvious as well, again, a right foot on a left leg. It's very easy to get mixed up about right and left. DNA, we all know it's a right-hand spiral. What that means is a British postage stamp, and you can see it goes up to the right. No problem, you'd have thought. Well, you get some strange things. This is an advert from Nature a couple of years ago where they had these recloning, PCR cloning systems. A new twist on a classic, indeed. Let's have a look. That is indeed a new twist on a classic. <laughs> Poor old Watson, they republished the double helix for its 50th anniversary. You can see what's happening, can't you? They got it back to front. <laughs> there are websites devoted to left-handedness with lists of famous left-handers. Let me just give you a couple of examples of how malicious these can be. Um, these are five famous left-handers, so-called. Quickly, Picasso. Here we are, he's in that list. As you can see, he's clearly right-handed, 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 right-handed. What about Einstein? <laughs> well, there is a famous picture of Einstein, and he's clearly writing with the left hand. But the more astute will notice they only got that in the book because they reversed the picture. <laughs> he was writing in mirror image as well. And we've got more right-handed things. Bob Dylan, this is a terrible book, well worth doing. You can see he's clearly left-handed because he, that gave him sensitivity to write all these lyrics, don't you know? And as you can see, he's clearly right-handed. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, there we are, left-hander's calendar. Another malicious book, left-handed book. The only left-handed man to sign some of the most, uh, the most important papers in the United States. Here he is, holding the quill pen in his left hand. Only trouble is, they reversed it. Left-handed Billy the Kid, he's a very interesting one. A film called The Left-Handed Gun, starring Bill, uh, Paul Newman. And there's a, a photograph of him from 1880. There he is. And if you look at the gun, you can see the sharpshooters on the left side. This looked like incontrovertible proof. The only trouble is, look more carefully. I don't know if you can see that, but his buttons on his waistcoat are there. And if you look at the buttons of a waistcoat, they should be the other side. This picture has actually been reversed because it's what's called a tintype photograph, and tintype photographs are contact prints. So he is right-handed. Please stop, I'm full. Please stop, I'm full. I better. Thank you. <laughs> Chris McManus, <laughs> questions? Wave your arm about. Here, we've got one in front here. How do I avoid left-right confusion? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. And the, the very simple answer is you buy a pair of socks like mine, which have right in 15 languages on one foot and left in 15 languages on the other foot. The only tricky bit is getting them on the right way round to start with. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Your choice. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't either. Can't see a damn thing here. Wave your arm if you're left. Is that a left arm? No, it's a right. Oh, okay, that's okay. Both arms. This is very confusing. <laughs> uh, I forgot what I was going to ask, but I, it'll <laughs> come back to me. Would you describe your research as sinister? <laughs> <laughs> no, I regard it as perfectly even-handed in general. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you. Chris McManus. Our next speaker has come from Rotterdam, the Netherlands, to join us today. He's a medical ethicist, and he spends a fair amount of his time looking through very old published medical reports in search of things that were overlooked or forgotten that may have stirring applications to we who are with us, we who are alive today. Please welcome Erwin Campagni. Imagine you go to sleep for a peaceful night and suddenly just after falling asleep or just before dawn, you wake up and you realize that you are completely paralyzed and you see everything. You cannot cry out for help and there is something on your chest sitting and even try to choke you. Uh, someone? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very common uh, condition. Uh, it's called uh, sleep paralysis. And uh, you cannot move at all, and something evil is in the room uh, to, uh, to uh, abduct you, alien abductions, or to uh, rape you, or to, uh, uh, at last, you think you are. But they are completely normal. It's sleep paralysis with, with hallucinations, and it's common in all cultures, and it's common in many uh, societies. And it inspired uh, filmmakers and artists to depict it. This, uh, this is the most famous depiction from Heinrich Fusel at 1719. And uh, you see the lady is paralyzed during her sleep and the demon is sitting on her chest, very characteristic, and other evil uh, characters are in the room also. Another depiction of it. But it, it's very common. 30% of the general population has at least one episode of sleep paralysis. May I raise hands? Yes. More than the evenings before. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> about 5% has an, an episode with visual, tactile, olfactory, or auditory uh, hallucinations. How and there are differences between males and females. And, and, and a female sleeper usually has a male intruder or a male demon uh, approach her, uh, an incubus. There uh, are famous cases in the literature. <laughs> <laughs> and males are usually, and this, these are not uh, very uh, pleasant uh, fantasies, I can assure you. Uh, <laughs> and there are... <laughs> Are, uh, lie under t by of other demons. And very rarely, this is very rare, a female sleeper with a female demon on top of her. Uh, I like old books and I, I like old medical history and I, I, I always search for cases uh, uh, which are new or uh, the first cases. And this is Eisbrand from Diemelbroek, a Dutch famous physician, and he wrote in 1664 uh, a paper with sleep paralysis and, and all hallucinations a great dog or thief lying up on their breast, and so on. This is a paper out of uh, 2007, The Hallucinating Art of Heinrich Fusel, the, the famous painting again, and uh, there was no correct description in world literature, they were wrong. This was in 1664, and you will sleep research, I described this. And other German uh, researchers uh, say, um, when you are in a supine position, laying on your back, you're more prone to the hallucinations. I can assure you that's true, that is so, that, that's, that's right. And uh, they thought they, were, thought they were, have, have found something new that was not true. Also in 1664, especially when they lie on the back and they give advice, sleep not on your back. Then alien abductions. Alien abductions. Some of you uh, believe and some people believe that alien abductions are uh, are real, but they're not. <laughs> uh, there are some famous cases. Uh, in 1957, uh, a, a Mexican, he believed he was abducted. Another famous case, there were to a star. Uh, but there are not completely normal sleep paralysis, that's alien abduction. And you can, don't leave it without it, you can insure yourself. And it, it, the insurance includes a frequent flyer endorsement with claim form, which requires a signature of an authorized onboard alien. <laughs> Here you see such an insurance form. It's real. 
And this is a, a London insurance broker, good fellow, Rebecca Ingram's person. And uh, if you are, can prove that you are impregnated during the abduction, you get <laughs> double payout. And since alien powers are unknown, men can appreciate the impregnated rider also. <laughs> so, uh, and believe me, many thousands of people have such an insurance. Here in Britain and the UK, other countries of the world, they don't believe it. Thank you. <laughs> and companions. What questions do you have? Wave those arms vigorously high in the air, and not just in your fantasy. How many of you experience now sleep paralysis and al not alien abduction, but <laughs> <laughs> hallucinations? May I see arms, please? He means now during these years, not now, this not, moment. Not, not, not on this moment, but the last years in your life. There are more than the than, than eyes before. Yeah. OK. We can share it. In a, in, a, in a talk group or so. <laughs> no questions? Question over here. here. Hey, um, do you never get instances of men having male demons visit them? <laughs> 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 do you ever have uh, reports of, of dreams with male demons yeah. afflicting male yeah. sleepers? I'm approached by males. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. But, more frequent by women, and they're more pleasant, <laughs> even the demons. <laughs> okay, Erwin Companion. <laughs> Our next speaker is a chemist based here in London. She was involved in the work that led to the Ig Nobel Chemistry Prize a few years ago. She'll tell you very briefly about that, and then she'll tell you about, uh, I think the only way to describe it accurately is a research adventure that she had recently here in town. Here is Fiona Barclay. I've got it. Great. Got it? Great. Yeah. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for having me. Being a girl, I, I'm going to talk about shopping. Uh, shopping in London, or how to make oneself extremely unpopular in Covent Garden. <laughs> so, uh, you've seen this prize before. Teal Grey won the same year as Chris McManus did. Uh, and here he is. I'm his colleague, so I get to do the UK tour. And he won for making a periodic table table. <laughs> Lovely thing. And all these little squares on the top open up and you find a real example of the element within. Now, what can I say? I'm going to skip over this because I took far more, more, too much time the last time. But the periodic table comes in many wonderful ways. A shower curtain. <laughs> Uber geek. <laughs> Cupcakes. <laughs> I could go on, but I shan't. So nowadays I make periodic tables, and I make periodic tables with the real elements inside. Now, that's cool, but it turns out to be a bit of an exercise in shopping and health and safety. So some of the elements are dead easy. You can go and get carbon, you can go down the barbecue shop and get some barbecue charcoal. You can go to the garden centre and get some sulphur for your plants, or you can go and buy iron or lead or anything like that quite easily. Now when it comes to some of the more exotic elements, shall we say, it can be a little bit more problematical. So we go to eBay. <laughs> and there's shops called things like Smart Elements. And they sell a variety of extremely fine elements, but again, perhaps not as dangerous as I might like. But you'd be surprised what you can find on eBay. I'm confused as to why you might want to carry a little bit of arsenic around in your pocket. But this didn't actually come off eBay, but this is one of our uh, finest exhibits. This is a white phosphorus grenade. <laughs> I'm assured there's no white phosphorus in it. A uranium tipped missile. Perfectly legally obtained, I'm honest. And of course, you can go to Amazon. <laughs> Now, this just looks dubious. I didn't buy this temple. 
So a little bit of Google research is generally advised. So I had a bit of a Google for plutonium. And I came up with a shop in Covent Garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so a homeopathy shop. Mm. So I googled homeopathy and plutonium and came up with a good deal of purple prose on the internet about what it did and how it arrived. And I'd like to read you just a tiny bit of this. The reasons to take plutonium. Suppressed and explosive energy feels heavy, disintegration, feels threatened with multiple th personalities, shape-shifting, <laughs> sexually aggressive or obligated, uh, suppressed and buried, sexually aggressive or servile, a threat to humanity <laughs> and threatened relationships. And this goes on and on and I'm very, very worried. This is pretty much how I feel about homeopathy. It, ben Goldacre ran a very good piece, which slightly debunked it in a more um, worthwhile way. Anyway, off I went. So I rolled... Thank you. I rolled up at Covent Garden, and I went into the shop, and it gave me great delight to say, please may I have some plutonium? very technical looking shop and the lady behind the counter said I shall fetch the chemist. <laughs> the chemist was duly fetched and my research was lacking at this point and she said to me what do you want the plutonium for? And I didn't really have an answer because I hadn't researched the symptoms. I said oh, well you know I, I, I'd really like a sample of plutonium and how strong would you like it madam? <laughs> Now, this is where everything went to pieces because I hadn't thought about that. And I said, as strong as possible, <laughs> which is, of course, the wrong answer in a homeopathy shop. <laughs> now, I had gone in with the very good intention of asking about what their initial source was because it's my understanding that they do start off with one drop at some point. <laughs> I'm very scared. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Fiona Barclay. <laughs> Questions, and, and uh, may I suggest that the, the person who asked the first question could conceivably ask the speaker to finish that last story. <laughs> so does somebody have an interesting question? What happened next, please? <laughs> May I have my slides back for a moment? Would that be...? Anyway, uh, so after a long discussion with chemists where I eventually had to explain that I built periodic tables and I was after extremely interesting samples and showed her website, she did eventually believe me. And she went through, disappeared, came back, and she said, uh, oh, the other question was, how would you like it? And I didn't know. So she gave me pillules which very entertainingly have a best before date of the 31st of the 3rd, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our parting shot was, don't, under any circumstances, take it, and you do realise there's no bloody plutonium in it. <laughs> Thank you. So that's the story. Perhaps we'll allow two more questions. Okay, thank you. You're right, can't see anything up here. Hello, up the back. You're a bit dim. Hmm. Ah, <laughs> it does work. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, ah, oh, damn it, I was intending to ask how you get plutonium. Obviously, from homeop homeopathy. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you do for the somewhat more fleeting elements? Are, are they just not included? Well, um, some of them, um, we have a slightly tenuous uranium ore, so that in the disintegration, uh, in the decay chain, things like francium uh, exist for a fleeting second, so there might be an atom at any one time. <laughs> <laughs> There's another question up um, just about in the same neighbourhood. Oh, yeah.
Just wondering, have you ever been into a sushi shop to collect some... <laughs> <laughs> it was, polonium was element of the month, fun month, with yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fiona Barker. We have but two speakers left. The first is an Ig Nobel Prize winner based here at Imperial College. Please welcome Piers Barnes. Hi. Um, so I was lucky enough to win the uh, Ig Nobel Prize for Mathematics in 2006 with my uh, co-winner, Nick Svensson, here, who's uh, depicted very uh, flatteringly. Um, we, uh, we won the prize for um, calculating the number of photographs you need to take to be almost certain that nobody's blinking in your shot. And uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the motivation behind this study, because there's, there's nothing worse than having a brilliant photo opportunity spoiled by somebody blinking. <laughs> And uh, so to, to, to get around this problem, Nick really wanted to know how, to, how, how many photographs she ought to take of groups of scientists in the division. And so we came up with a, a formula, and we condensed it down to a rule of thumb. And uh, so how many shots do you need to take to be, of a group of less than 20 people to be sure nobody's blinking? Well, in, if the light's bad, Take the number in the group and divide by two. Take that many shots. If the light's good, then divide the number by three. And that's our rule of thumb. Of course, that, was, that came from a, a formula. And normally, if Nick were here, she'd, she'd dissuade me not to show you any maths. But since she isn't, I'm going to just show you a little bit. So a blink lasts for about a quarter of a second. And if that coincides with the shutter time, um, we have a window of time during which a photo can be spoiled. And uh, we call that time T. And uh, it's the, the sum of the blink and the shutter time. And uh, if somebody blink, blinks at an average rate of, of x blinks per minute, then we can find the, uh, we can find the, the uh, probability that they'll blink. And then the probability that, that they won't blink is 1 minus xt. And then, ah. Uh, Sorry. Uh, Asaf, hi, hi. Um, I'm, I'm in a talk right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was meant to be a joke. Yeah, OK, J just put the uh, goat into the cupboard. OK. Um, yeah. OK, um, as you can tell, that was probably a, that was a setup, because Actually, there's a similarity, as you can imagine, between a uh, photograph being spoiled by somebody blinking and a mobile phone call uh, going off during, um, during some time period, like a, like a blink. And um, I wonder if you could all turn on your mobile phones at this point. Um, <laughs> so what I thought for, for, for this lecture, we'd investigate what the chances are of an event being erupted, interrupted by a mobile phone call. And I did a little bit of rooting around, and it turns out that uh, there are, an average UK adult receives about four calls a minute. I'm uh, sorry, not, not a minute, <laughs> a day. <laughs> uh, about 0 .004 uh, two calls per, per minute. And uh, so, if this room were totally packed with 700 people, we'd expect about three calls a minute coming through with the Poisson distribution. And so an event of two minutes, you'd pretty much expect there definitely to be a mobile phone call coming in. Um, but actually, experience suggests there aren't this many shots normally. And <laughs> OK, perhaps there are. <laughs> um, so. There's a joke amongst, uh, amongst uh, physicists um, where um, a farmer came along to a physicist and said, uh, my, my cows aren't producing enough milk. What can I do? And the physicist goes away for, for hours and hours, weeks and weeks, and eventually he comes back and he says, I've got an answer for you. I'm going to give it at a seminar. So the farmer goes to the seminar 
And the, the physicist starts by saying, assuming a spherical cow. <laughs> and, well, that, I guess that just signifies the, the sort of oversimplification that, that us scientists like to do to obviously very complicated problems. So I thought we'd better look at the assumptions we're going to make here. Um, and uh, I'm going to assume that uh, the calls are coming in at a, an approximately constant rate uh, per, per minute or through, through the day, through the wakeful day. But of course, in practice, most people turn off their phones during the event, particularly if they've just heard somebody else is going off. So we can define something called an inconsideracy factor. <laughs> and I've defined it as being people's forgetfulness plus their rudeness. And of course, after the first call, when you've, when you've been reminded, then we can knock out the forgetful po portion because they turn off their phone. And I asked a few friends to do a study for me. And I can, I can announce that... Stop! <laughs> but this is so important. <laughs> but this is so important. Using my spherical cow approximation, I can give the consideration. Here's Barnes. I know it's a dangerous precedent to follow up on, let alone set, but if somebody has that same question that was asked to the previous speaker. Are there any questions? <laughs> Does anyone want to know what the inconsideracy factor of the human race is? Okay, someone, in, someone in the first row just asked that very question. Well, as it happens, I asked some friends, and they measured the length of time till the first call in, event, in, in various events. And it turns out that the inconsideracy factor, based on about seven or 8,000 audience hours before the first call, is 0.12. <laughs> Thank you very much. One more question. <laughs> <laughs> Could you elaborate on that, perhaps? <laughs> Sir, over here. Point one to what? <laughs> and, can we have, and in Imperial as well as CGI, as, um, it's, it's a, as metric, if you will. It's a dimensionless constant. Uh, <laughs> right. Piers, Piers Barnes. You can... If you'd like to follow up on that question or anything else with the speakers, just come afterward to the little reception across the hall. We have just one speaker left. I, I would like to ask all of you to turn off your <laughs> mobile phones, pagers, whatever. It, uh, it is a matter of health and safety um, to one person that there be no such distractions during this. Our final speaker is the co-winner of the 2007 Ig Nobel Medicine Prize. He will explain what he did to win that. Some of you I know saw him here last year. And he'll also tell you a little bit about some of the research he and his colleague have done since then. Here from the United States is Dan Meyer. Thank you. In 2007, Dr. Brian Whitcomb and I were honored to receive the Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine for a little paper that we wrote that was called this. And it was published in a little magazine that I'd never, never heard of before, <laughs> called this, the December issue of the, the 2006 of the British Medical Journal. Why did we do a paper on sword swallowing and its side effects? Well, over the 4,000 year history of sword swallowing, there had never been really a legitimizing paper done by the medical community or for the medical community uh, in any of the medical journals on the subject of sword swallowing. So we set about to rectify that. 
Uh, we found out that uh, over the past 4,000 years, we know of 287 people who have swallowed a sword, uh, that we know them by name. And uh, of those 287, about 29 had died. That's about a 10% fatality rate. Historically, we know that Dr. Adolf Kussmaul, in 1868, used a uh, sword swallower to, do, to develop the rigid endoscope in Freiburg, Germany. And he trotted this uh, sword swallower around and did demonstrations and uh, used the, him to, to show the, uh, the endoscope in, the, in uh, those times back then. Uh, also in 1897, a uh, Scottish doctor by the name of uh, Dr. Stevens used a sword swallower to uh, study digestion. And in 1906, we had the first case of uh, electrocardiogram in Wales as done on a sword swallower. So we did our study. It was a two-year study of 110 known sword swallowers that we knew of by name. We attempted to contact them. I happen to be the president of the Sword Swallowers Association International, so I sent out an email to all of them. We got back feedback uh, from 46 sword swallowers, of which six were women. The average age was 31 years. Most were self-taught. One of the things we learned from our study that it took three to seven years to learn to swallow a sword. We have other information here, but I'll fly through it very quickly here. 25 people had swallowed more than uh, one sword at a time. Uh, only five had swallowed more than five swords at once. <laughs> and that's me in 2005 swallowing seven swords at once when we got a Guinness World Record for that. Uh, injuries, we found out there were several injuries. Uh, 19 described what's called sword throats in the learning stages. <laughs> Six had suffered perforations. Three required surgery. Three had probable perforations. One had pleurisy, and I can talk about that one firsthand because that happened to me. One had uh, pericarditis, and one had a bread knife removed. <laughs> 16 had intestinal bleeding, and some had medical bills up to $76,000 US. Results of our paper, a previous minor injury may lead to a more serious injury, and injuries occur more often when multiple or unusual swords are being swallowed, <laughs> or when distraction causes the performers to lose focus. For example, a belly dancer had three swords in her when uh, somebody tried to tuck a $500 bill in. She, they scissored. She ended up losing 53% of her blood, most of it on the ceiling of the emergency room. <laughs> Another is an injury while swallowing six swords while a misbehaving <laughs> macaw was on the shoulder. Um, that occurred when I was taping a, a bit for the David Letterman show, and my macaw climbed around the back of my neck, and I turned my head. <laughs> Not a good idea to do, to do while you have six swords down your throat. Results, occasionally a sword is difficult to advance or retreat. When in doubt, don't force a sword. <laughs> and when injured, don't swallow another sword. <laughs> now we did get some new information right after the paper came out. We had a rash of injuries, of sword swallowing injuries. Um, first of all, why would, who, why would somebody take up sword swallowing? What type of person would do that? We found out that 85% are male. <laughs> Usually young males, about 17, 18, you know, hey, watch this. <laughs> that leaves you with the other 15%, which, you guess it, are females. And I'm not even going to go there while they might be good at swallowing long objects like that. <laughs> the current average height is now about 177 centimeters. Current average weight is about 80 kilos. 95% um, are Caucasian, 3% are Asian, about 2% Latino. We have no Negroid sword swallowers that we know of, uh, that we have found yet in the world. 68% are in North America, about 19% here in Europe, about 9% in South Pacific, about three, four, almost 4% in Asia, none in South America or Africa. The average age, 35.8 years. The earliest age was 12 years. The youngest currently is 19 years old. The oldest is currently 73 years old. He also holds the distinction of being the longest to perform. He's been performing for 61 years since he started at the age of 12. And the tallest is a seven foot three giant by the name of George the Giant, the fellow that I kind of learned from. And he swallows a 33 inch sword, which happens to be the longest sword. Many come from similar performance backgrounds. We found that most, of, about 28% of the sword swallowers learned juggling first. Then 29% of us learned <laughs> Glass eating, which is where you unscrew a light bulb and actually just eat the light bulb. It is possible. Uh, I do it all the time. 54% uh, of us do fire breathing. Another 62% do fire eating, which is different than fire breathing. And then 62% do the human blockhead, which is when you pound an, a spike or an ice pick into your nose or a running drill into the nose. And we're pretty sure that about 100% <laughs> Sorry. 
Some learn by using fingers, chopsticks, drumsticks, rubber plastic tubing, coat hangers. Uh, the coat hanger is the most popular method for most people to learn. Like I said, it takes three to seven years practicing 10 to 12 times a day, every day. Other items swallowed, long-handled spoon, 24-inch uh, uh, screwdriver. I swallow surgical forceps, they're about 19 inches long, and uh, a hedge clippers, actually. <laughs> We've got a Swedish sword swallower who used to swallow this until he injured himself. It's a big, long sleigh runner called a Sparstöckning. And we've got one fellow down in Italy who swallows a running jackhammer that is used for punning snow. <laughs> we had a rash of injuries right after the, after the, uh, the paper was published uh, in Melbourne, two in, in Australia, two in Las Vegas, within weeks after the, publish, the paper was published and they almost died. Uh, almost to a T, all, all of them were put on bed rest on an IV drip, no solid food for almost four weeks for the most part. That's the standard uh, healing regimen for sword swelling injuries. Um, just a few weeks ago, on February 6th, we were notified about this fellow in China who's been swallowing a single sword for eight years. Uh, he apparently saw a video of me swallowing a curved sword where I have to bend my body to about like this type of an angle to swallow it. He tried that, punctured his esophagus, and as you can see right here, doctors successfully performed open chest surgery for four hours to repair the damage. As far as we know, he's still alive. I don't think he's swallowing swords right now because uh, he's still in the healing process. We did receive a number of uh, obituaries and other information. <laughs> we, uh, very f quite a few of these, and they were quite interesting. This one I want to show you, though, in particular. This fellow, instead of using the slender sword, he took for in his act swallowing a violin bow. So that goes along with our paper that if you swallow things out of the ordinary or beyond the scope of just a regular everyday sword swallow, um, you can be injured. So if you're thinking about taking up sword swallowing or violin bow swallowing, don't. <laughs> Got some other folks that were, that were injured. I'm being approached here. <laughs> Dan Meyer, please stop, I've got the sword. Uh, before we take a couple of questions, if anyone has any questions, would you mind if we have a quick demonstration? If you would mind, there are exits on both sides and in the rear. Here's and Dan Meyer. Please turn your cell phones off for this part. <laughs> uh, do we have anybody in the medical community in the, in the audience tonight? Any doctors? We've got several doctors, nurses, emergency <laughs> medical folks, uh, brain, brain surgeons? No, okay. Uh, for those of you in the medical community, what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide the blade into my oral cavity, my mouth. Uh, flip back my, or press down my tongue, slide the blade in the uh, upper esophageal chamber up here, uh, through the hyoidal ring, behind the prominential laryngeum here, the, uh, the, the Adam's apple that protects the voice box, the, the pharynx here. Uh, go through the um, upper esophageal sphincter, right up here behind, up in this area of the throat, the blade can go in one of two different directions. It can either go into the uh, pharynx or the trachea, as you say here in, in the UK, and into the lungs, or down the esophagus and into the stomach. In my case, I hope it goes down the esophagus and into the stomach. So what I have to do is I have to flip closed my epiglottis so it doesn't go into my lungs, slide it down my esophagus in the upper esophageal chamber into the uh, chest chamber, the thoracic chamber here, between the lungs, slide it down my esophagus, then I have to repress the peristalsis reflex, which is a reflex of 22 pairs of muscles that forces your food down into your stomach. At this point, there is kind of an obstruction in the center of the esophagus. The esophagus kind of leans a little bit this direction, and that's your heart. So, <laughs> actually it's my heart. So, <clears throat> what I have to do at this point is I have to uh, slide the blade down, and as the blade straightens out the esophagus, it pushes the heart to the left. So I have to nudge my heart to the left. And the, the sword is separated from the heart by about an eighth of an inch of esophageal tissue. So those of you in the, the very front rows here, if you watch very carefully, you might be able to see my blade beat with my heart like this. Once I get it past the heart, I slide it past my sternum, my breastbone, 
Slide it uh, through the uh, diaphragm here. Relax the lower esophageal sphincter. That's a very tight rubber band that kind of closes off your stomach. Then I slide the blade on down into the stomach. And uh, I kind of have to straighten the, the esophagus out and down into the stomach, all the way down to the bottom of the stomach, uh, down to the du duodenum or, or duodenum, as some people say. And if I keep going further with the longer swords, I go all the way down to my fallopian tubes. <laughs> now, we won't go that far today, not on this little sword. Okay? That's in medical terms. In plain old English and common terms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ram about a foot and a half of cold hard steel down my gullet to tickle the bottom of my tummy. Okay? Um, when you walked in here earlier, how many of you thought sword swallowing is fake, a gimmick, a trick? Quite a few hands. Okay. We'll ask that question a little bit later. So I'm going to need your silence, your, your attention on this one. I have to really focus. It requires razor-sharp concentration and pinpoint accuracy to line everything up and get it to go right down. So I do need you to hold your applause here for a little bit while I concentrate. This is extremely dangerous. It could kill me. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> now, this is not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Now, how many of you think sword swallowing is real? How many of you think it's real? I'm not sure about this stage, but. Uh, that one tastes like chicken because that's what I had for lunch. But. Let me show you one more slide. If you could put up one more slide here. Let me show you what happens with a little bit longer blade. Would you like to see a longer blade? This is what it looks like here, if you can just watch this for a second. I guess down by the stomach there. This is a lateral view, removing the sword. There you go. Would you like to see a little bit longer sword? <laughs> Swallowed, I mean, yeah, okay. I need somebody to take a look at this. Will you take a look at this and verify that it is real steel? Looks like real stuff. Just make sure there's no buttons that it's not going to go into the handle or anything. It's not going to fold up or curl up or anything. That's, you're pretty sure it's a real deal. Okay. And this lady knows she's an expert on steel here. So. Okay. Now I'm going to do something a little bit different with this sword to prove that it is real. I'm going to uh, attempt to slide this sword down into my body. And to prove that there's nothing that goes in the handle, I'm going to attempt to do it no hands. Okay? So. Now, the dangerous part about this is when it hits the, the heart, sometimes it sends like electrical impulses through my, my body, and I see stars and those little demons on my chest, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so this one's called the drop. And if I'm lucky, I'll do the drop and fling here. I need your help on this one. This is extremely dangerous. It could kill me. I do hope you enjoy it. You're supposed to laugh when I say that. <laughs> All right, I need all of you to help me with the counting part, okay? <laughs> For the rest of you in the remedial section of the audience, <laughs> count with us, will you? If you'd like to, since this is the end of our tour, this is our last night, if you'd like to, we can try something a little bit more spectacular than that, okay? <laughs> I'd like to try something that's a little bit more dangerous, if that's okay with you. All right. <laughs> now, these are still my small swords, folks, but uh, I need you to check that one out, make sure that's real. Oh, God. Is it kind of a heavy sword? It's real. It's real, she says. Actually, I need you to come on up here with it. Oh, Bring that no. up here. Hold on. Come on up here. <laughs> Come on up here. 
All the way up here, there you go. Right up the steps, I need you to bring that on up like Sir Lancelot or something. Now what I'm gonna do, this is three times more dangerous than regular sword swallowing. Okay. I just uh, don't think I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> no, but they will. <laughs> Why don't you stand over here, right over here, on the trap door here, okay? All right, now face towards the audience, with your feet shoulder width apart, okay? Now lean your head back and say ah. <laughs> you don't want to swallow the sword? I don't want to swallow the sword. No, no. How about if I swallow this one, you swallow that one at the same time? It's kind of cinema. Why don't you swallow the sword and I'll stand here and watch? Okay, we'll do that. She will stand here and watch and verify that this is real. Now, yeah. this is three times more dangerous than regular sword swallowing. First of all, folks, I'm going to impale myself with this sword. This will come down here right about to my belt buckle. Okay? That's quite a ways down. There's my I little belly button right there. I have a feeling I've got to roll in this. No, please don't roll in this. <laughs> <laughs> Just stand still. Okay, I'm going to swell this one down here to my stomach. People have died doing this. 29 people have died doing this, so this is extremely dangerous. First of all, danger number one, I'm going to attempt to do the drop, where I drop the blade down into my body like this, okay? Danger number two, I'm going to attempt to double my body directly in half and bow. Hopefully without impaling any internal organs. So you can see down the blade, all the way down to the pit of my stomach. For those of you who want some photographic proof that sword swallowing is real, in the few, first few rows, you can get out your, your cell phones and, and take some pictures there, okay? For the rest of you, you might want to, uh, on your cell phone, dial 9, 9, and get ready to punch that other 9 in case anything goes wrong, okay? Then danger number three. I'm going to bow like this. I'm going to come all the way around so you can see down the blade just once. Then I'm going to come around here, and I'm going to ask a total stranger to extract the blade from the pit of my stomach. That's you. That's where you come in. Okay. I thought I might. Yeah, you think? Okay, good. Now, what I need you to do is when I get to you here, just take the blade and pull it straight out. Okay, now don't wait too long. If you wait too long, my stomach can retch and it can puncture against the bottom of the blade there. Puncture my stomach. So don't we just very quickly pull it out. I, I, I think I do. Yeah. Well, that's very good, good. to hear because I don't. But whatever you do, don't pull it out too quickly, okay? Or it can slice the sides of my throat. <laughs> Okay. And whatever you do, pay attention here. When you pull it out, don't scrape it up my backbone like this, because that really hurts. Brrr, it really hurts. Just pull it straight out like that, okay? Straight out. Hold it over your head. When she does, you'll give her a big round of applause, right? Like Sir Lancelot pulling the sword out of the stone, right? Okay. You Get ready? ready the 9-9 nine, nine bit, all right? Okay. Whatever you do, don't go like this. Okay. <laughs> it's not a joystick, okay? Just, and whatever you do, don't push. Don't push. No. Don't push. Don't push. I, I Pull it straight out over your head push. like this. Push. You may not want to stand right under it in case it drips, but okay. You think you can do this? No. No. I think you can. I think you, I do. I don't have any choice. You, you don't have much up. choice. I don't have much choice. No. No, no so really, you know, we're, we're stuck with it. We're stuck with it. They're, they're, they're all out there. They're waiting they're now. Watching. They're waiting. You, don't need you can keep on talking if you want to, but. <laughs> this You're is, just stalling. You're no. just getting me to talk. You're stalling. This is the non-speaking role here, but okay. So but what I need fine. you to do, just pull it on out. When, when they pull it out, they will applaud. They'll jump to their feet in a standing ovation for you. Okay? Are you ready? Or call 999. Or call 999, right. You'll tell me when to pull it out. Well, I won't be able to tell you much, but <laughs> you'll know. <laughs> you want to go on the road? You get you one of those little tassel outfits? All right, here it goes. Yeah, cartwheels, yeah, yeah. This is extremely dangerous. Oh, you know all that. Okay. This is th three times more dangerous than regular sword swallowing. Okay, three times. Here we go. Come on, let's hear it for her. Big round of applause. There we go. There you go. Now we'll take a bow. Take a bow. There you go. One more time. Thank you. How many of you would like to see her swallow the sword, huh?
question? How do we get them on the airplane? Very carefully. Uh, it, pack them in my bag. I can only bring these small swords so they fit in my suitcase. But, and sometimes I have to do demonstrations for the security guys. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> Because if I didn't, they wouldn't let me bring them on the plane. <laughs> oh, why do I swallow swords? I presume that's a question. Can we take that as one of the questions? Sure, that sounds like a question. Okay. I personally have several different reasons. I'll make it very short. As a little kid, the, the big kids used to beat up on me and, and pick on me, and I always wanted to do real magic things that they couldn't do, like fly or walk through walls or make myself disappear. And now I am, kind of. <laughs> um, but in, uh, I didn't believe sword swallowing was real as I grew up. When I moved to India in 1977 as a missionary to India, I saw sword swallowers on the streets in the villages there, and I saw that it was real, and it made a huge impact on my life, so much so that uh, I'm doing it now today. I do it because, first of all, there are less than a few dozen sword swallowers left in the entire world uh, actively performing. And as the president of the Sword Swallowers Association, I'm here to preserve and promote this ancient dying art. But out of uh, 6.7 billion people, a few, few dozen sword swallowers left, that means that each of us sword swallowers are about one in every 200 million people. So I do it because I can, because a lot of people can't. I do it to uh, inspire people, to show people that what you can really do with the human body and how incredible the human body is. And I do it uh, also because I like to see the looks on your faces. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe one more question. You want one more? One more, one, one final question. Is it possible to hum a tune or a rousing tune to further delight your audience while sword swallowing? Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean with a sword down While the sword swallowing. Oh. Uh, I'm not sure, I haven't tried that. But... Could this be the premiere? Uh, this could be, this could be. Should we do one more with a hum? You want to do one more with a hum? Yeah. All right. Uh, I am going to need another volunteer. This is going to be a little bit more dangerous than that last one. I need a volunteer about this tall with a light blue tie. Oh, there's one right there. Okay, you, sir. Yeah. And you've never swallowed a sword before? No, no, no. Okay. Come on up here. We're going to try something. Now, this is going to be a little bit more dangerous than your average sword swallow. I need you to take a look at this and verify that it is a real blade. It's not going to fold up in the handle. It's a real blade. OK, that's not going to bend, curl up, or anything. A little wobbly, but it's yeah. been beat up a little bit. OK, I need you to stand over here. Have you ever seen the movie uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yep. OK, I need you to stand over here and do your best uh, Indiana Jones impersonation. Can you tell me what that is? It's a whip balling something. That's a, a whip what? Whip. OK, I didn't, had never heard it called whip bollocks. And, <laughs> I don't know what that means. This is a whip. So. You're going to do your best Indiana Jones impersonation, and I'm going to need you to extract the blade from my throat using that object there, okay? You're kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm deadly serious. You think you can do that? Yeah, go, we'll give it a go. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Can you hum while I'm doing this? Mm. Yeah, okay, good. Will that work for you? No? You two might want to move back there. You might. Yes, please. <laughs> why don't you, yeah, why, why don't you, yeah. So am I okay? Yeah, you stand, you stand right there. Now. Oh, you're perfectly okay. I wouldn't worry if I were you. <laughs> You've got glasses on your eyes, so I think your eyes are okay. Okay, now here's what I need you to do. Uh, once I swallow the sword, not before I swallow the sword, but once I swallow the sword, I'll, I'll swallow it this way. When I get the sword down, I will turn to you, and I will bow and try to hum a little bit. And um, what do you want me to hum? I don't know what to hum. So, and then I'm going to count from three to one, and I need you, the audience to count with me here. We'll count three, two, one. Then you might pause just a second, make sure we have eye contact, and then I need you to whip the sword out of my throat, okay? Now, to do this, put, hold your hand up way high over your head, a little higher, straight up, okay? And you're going to pull the sword straight out of my throat. Just whip it out fairly fast, OK? Don't, not a little wimpy one, full of fairly fast. Whatever you do, though, don't, don't snap the whip, because it'll snap up through the back of my neck, or it'll catch on my teeth and yank my teeth out. So just pull it steady, very quickly, and uh, 
everything will be okay. Let's hope so. <laughs> nine, nine. Okay, here it goes. I'm a little slack here in this front. This really is extremely dangerous, folks. <laughs> And when he does, you guys will give him a big round of applause, standing ovation, right? Okay, here goes. Give me a little slack. Why am I doing this? <laughs> Should have stayed in school. thank the British Science Association for organizing National Science and Engineering Week and inviting us to do this. The Imperial College Graduate Schools, thank you very much, especially Bernie Morley, uh, Philippa Schellard, uh, Sally Baker, and Sophie White. And I would like to thank our timekeeper, if you could stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Professor Robert Schroeder. Miss Sweetie Poo, come up on stage. And our speakers, please stand up. Chris, thank you all for coming. <laughs>